folks, welcome to the lovely Hindwheel Dam, not too far from Rivlin in Sheffield. Today, I want to talk to you about roach fishing. One of my favourite things to do in autumn, especially when you're catching big wild roach like these. Now, the lake we're on today is actually, it's a, I suppose you'd call it a park lake. It's part of a series of dams along the River Rivlin, which runs down into Sheffield. It's clear water, it's peaty, and you really do have to be on the top of your game to catch the biggest roach that are in here. It takes a lot of skill, and it's something that I've really, really enjoyed perfecting on this sort of clear water venue over the years. So what I want to show you today is six little tips, basically. Six little things that I've learnt when it comes to catching roach that will hopefully help you catch more in your own fishing. So we'll get this one in the net and then, oh look at that beauty, and then we'll bring you some of my favourite roach fishing tips. But that, to me, is what it's all about. Just lovely. So the first thing I want to talk about today is where you choose to fish. And that's important for a few reasons. First and foremost, you need to be somewhere that the fish are comfortable to settle. So it needs to be far enough away from any bankside disturbance to know that you can really get the fish competing. But that certainly doesn't mean going out to 14, 16 metres all the time. In fact, generally, I'll catch the fish as close as I think I comfortably can and where I'm confident they'll settle. So today, I've chosen a line about six metres out where I've got a nice flat bottom and that bottom really is important because you're obviously fishing a lot, catching a lot of these fish, look at that, catching a lot of these fish as the bait settles with light strung out rigs. So what you're not wanting is any obstructions, any obstructions in the way where your hook, hook bait might fall over a branch or something like that. A nice clear flat bottom and I've plumbed around and found about a metre square of flat bottom so I know I can flick my rig around that area with confidence and know it'll fall through and won't meet any obstructions as it falls and that's really really important you want to be able to lay your rig in in all sorts of different directions around your feed area and fool those wary fish that are sat off the back edge of your feed. Now secondly I don't like fishing to my limit and by that I mean if I knew I could comfortably feed 13 metres a pole like I could today, for example, if I started at 13 metres, I'd have nowhere to go. So by starting at 6 metres where I've started today, if the fish do back off or become wary in that clear water, I can follow them out later. So you're always giving yourself somewhere to go. And lastly, by fishing a bit shorter, I'm making life easy in terms of loose feed. Now, what I'm trying to do today is group my feed just this side of my float. And what that means is, I'm fishing on the back side of the bait. So that bait's dropping through just past, basically, the main body of feed. And that often fools the bigger specimens, the bigger roach sit just past the bait and nail it as they come in. You can see I'm feeding regularly via catapult. The reason I'm doing that, if you start throwing bait on a clear venue like this, you've got a lot of big movements, you've got your arm flying up in the air like that. I don't like that. I think big dramatic movements potentially spook fish on clear water venues. So I'd much rather group the bait with a catapult and I can do that nicely at six metres. Much closer than six metres, I'd probably struggle to do it with a catapult. I would have to throw it and the whole thing would become a little bit more frantic and animated. So that's tip number one, folks. Fish close enough to you to be able to feed accurately on a flat bottom and, far, and, and always give yourself somewhere else to go so you can follow the fish as they back off in the session. So tip number two relates to floats. And you can see I've got here the old classic Preston Chianti. Now that's a great roach fishing float, but there are plenty of other very good models available. I'm just going to talk about what I look for in a float and why I think it's so important to this style of fishing. First and foremost, the tip material and diameter. You need to be able to really dot that float down so you can see what's happening as that 
bait fall through the lower layers of water. If you've got a big thick bristle, I guarantee you would not see half the bites you get on a Chianti or a thinner top float. So you can dot these down really nicely. They've got a little cane bristle on them. And then obviously you're reading, you're reading the float as it falls through that last little part of the water. So bristle material and type is probably the most important aspect to consider. It's got to be fine. You've got to be able to dot it down. And a Chianti, obviously, with it being cane, you can do that really, really nicely. Secondly, the shape and body type. Now you can see with this, as I'm catching these fish through the water, the float is really following that bait down. It's a slim profile, so you can sort of read those droppers as it falls. And the float follows the bait as it falls through the water. So again, a nice slim body is also important. Now, if I was fishing deeper water or looking to fish on the bottom, I'd definitely favour a wire bristle because it's more stable. But for this kind of fishing, when we're searching the water and fishing through the layers, a glass or carbon stem is definitely the way to go as it lets you follow, again, the bait through. With a wire stem, it would tend to just cock straight away, so you're not getting any of that ability to read the float. So float type's really important. Look for one with a fine bristle that you can dot down and read and a slim profile that will follow your bait as it falls through the water. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is mainline and hook length diameter, which is two of the most important things to get right when it comes to roach fishing generally, to be honest. Now, you don't always need a fine mainline. That's my first point. Now, a lot of people associate it with tiny little mainlines. And the problem with that is you can end up with an undue amount of tangles. And to be honest, I think thicker mainlines often give better presentation in still conditions because they fall a bit slower through the water. So I've got 013 reflow power on today. I would scale that down to thinner main lines if it was windy, because I don't like the wind picking up the main line between the pole tip and the float and moving the rig around. But on a still day, when you can get away with it, thicker main lines fall slower through the water and tangle less, which is a definite advantage. Hook lengths are much more important. I always like to use as light a hook length as I dare. So today I've actually got an 07 fluorocarbon hook length on. Why fluorocarbon? The main reason is it's stiffer than uh, <clears throat> the main reason is it's stiffer than mono, which means it tangles less. It also falls in a straight line through the water and works absolutely beautifully. It's said by some anglers that it's invisible under the water. Whether that's true, I'll be honest, I don't know. I just know it works well, it very rarely lets me down. And if you fish it in fine sizes, I mean, I'm using 07, but anything between 06 and 08 is my usual uh, port of call for roach fishing. You'll find you get a lot more bites than you do with thicker diameter hook lengths. The next thing I want to talk about is hook choice. And there's loads of different fine wire hook patterns out there on the market, but there's only really one that I turn to for this style of roach fishing through the water. And that is the Gamakatsu Green Gamma. I've got it in sizes 16, 18 and 20 with me today. I've started on a 20, in the better spells, stepped up to a 16. And when the fishing's been tougher, I've stepped down to a 20. Now you wouldn't believe the difference it makes being able to alternate between different sizes of hook. There'll be days, on, the, on, on rock hard days, it might be that you can only get a bite on a size 20. Whereas, when the fishing's good, a size 16, and you can scull them all day long. 
I also carry a few different lengths of hook length with me. As I mentioned, these are all tied on fluorocarbon, but I do have them with me in lengths between four and eight inches. And that's something else to experiment on the day. Make sure you take them with you and make sure you play about. Generally speaking, the better the fishing, the shorter the hook length you'll get away with. And if it's a bit tricky, or maybe if you're after that slower fall, or if you're having to wait a bit longer for bites, a, uh, a longer hook length will be better because it gives that more natural presentation and also allows you to present a dead static bait. Right folks, I didn't really want to share this one with you, but tip number five relates to a deadly little rig that Lee Edwards showed me at Whiteacres some years ago. And what it is, basically, is a lighter float set slightly shallower than the main rig that you're catching on. Now you can move this around, I mean this is a, a 3B8 Preston Chianti, my other rigs are 4B10 and you can see at the moment I've got that set as deep as I can, but I'll through the day I'll be moving it about as shallow as maybe, you know, two and a half, three foot like that and sliding it back up to the top. The key thing with it is, it's 3B8, so it's as light as you can get. It's got strung out, four number 12s down the line, so a dead light shot in pattern. It falls dead slowly through the water. So you're presenting a really slow sinking bait anywhere between half and three quarters of the way down the water column. And this often fools you some bigger fish as well. But it also, like I just had a little quieter spell then, and I picked this up and nicked a couple of quick fish. So it'll either bring you bites when the other rig's slowing down, or it'll fool you a couple of extra bigger fish. Right folks, tip number six relates to this stuff. Bait, and also how you feed it. Bait, first of all, you don't need loads of bait when it comes to uh, winter or autumn roach fishing. But what you do need is really, really good quality bait. Now this here is uh, from Wickersley Angling, it's Chilton bait. And, you know, through the course of my life when I've been fishing silverfish matches, I've always gone out of my way to fetch the best quality bait I can. When I lived in the Midlands, I drove to Tom Lane's shop, which was about 40 minutes from where I lived just to get it. And I'd go out of my way to go to Wickersley and get good quality bait now. In terms of um, what I get, what's well, another nice roach there. I'll always bring a pint or two to most sessions um, and the reason for that is I don't want to run out but you really don't need to bring gallons and gallons of it with you. Um, it's more important you've got the right bait and the key is that you feed it regularly. One thing I do do to my bait to basically make it a little bit different to everything else out there and because I've been involved with the development of the stuff is I add a couple of drops of the Fuca Sensate liquid to it just to make it taste a little bit different. I never used to do that. I've been playing with it these last few months. Um, and I can honestly say it hasn't had a detrimental effect. And on a few occasions, I do think it's got me a few extra bites. But the most important things are the right bait, good quality maggots. And when you're actually on the bank and fishing, feeding regularly, keeping that bait trickling through the water so that you're constantly getting the fish competing and catching them. I hope these six tips will uh, put a few roach in your net this autumn and winter. And remember, for more videos like this, subscribe to the YouTube channel on the link below. Mm -hmm.